So the next panel is the governance for the blockchain economy, new challenges for regulators and compliance. So I'd like to invite up Manny Igar to the stage. Uh, he's from Digital Futures Quantex Summit and the Block Forum International. So welcome to the stage and also like to invite his panelists up with him as well. right here. Uh, hi everybody, I know it's the afternoon and we're going to keep this light and entertaining. I always like to put on a good show and I've got an illustrious panel here, veterans from the industry and uh, I'm going to say very little, they're going to speak uh, and I'm going to ask by, kick off by please introduce yourself briefly and then we'll dive straight in. Hello there everyone, uh, I'm Marcus Hinckley, I'm from Gowling WLG, I am a corporate and securities lawyer and I'm part of the Blockchain and Smart Contracts Group. Hi, John Bullock, uh, formerly NASDAQ and Toronto Stock Exchange, now working on Quantex, a regulated venue for securities and crypto tokens. Hi, I'm Shaden Duran. I'm the CEO of Global Blockchain Technologies, and I'm also an investor in a number of regulated securities tokens exchanges. And um, I've, I've been in the cryptocurrency space since 2010 and worked on many of the processes and I'm Richard Carlton, the Chief Executive Officer of the Canadian Securities Exchange, uh, an exchange which announced uh, plans to uh, launch a blockchain-enabled clearing and settlement system for securitized tokens uh, back in February, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that shortly. Absolutely. So the topic is a rather heavy, ponderous one, but I think at the end of the day, what people want to know is, this has been, to be, as I say everywhere I go, I speak a lot at various conferences, this has been the year of the regulator, uh, last year we was the year of the Lambo, uh, so this year is a little bit uh, different, and it's at the point where innovation and I think in entrepreneurial entrepreneurial spirit collided with regulations, different jurisdictions, uh, how people get treated, raising money through ice goes, and and uh, how, how do we manage and govern this going forward? Now, everyone that's on the stage, on the panel, has had different experiences and rep represent different aspects of this with, with deep experience themselves professionally. I'm going to let them each speak ar around where do they think, how far have we come in Canada and elsewhere um, in this process, and, and what can we look forward to in 2019? Okay, cool. Sure. I've always said that there actually aren't that many difficult problems uh, posed by cryptocurrency or the blockchain. I don't think there's a gray area. I think it's very clear. If you're a security, you are governed by the Securities Act in the relevant provincial jurisdiction or in the United States. If you are not, then it's something else, and you're probably a commodity, in which case you're governed by the CFTC in the United States and the Commodity Act in, uh, in, in, in Canada. Now, what that means practically is that the SEC and the CFTC are on a daily basis uh, charging people with the legal securities distributions uh, that took place under the guise of uh, uh, coin offerings over the last uh, couple of years. Or people are looking to find a way to get to the light and use this spectacular, wonderful infrastructure that we built up over the years. So, you know, the next time somebody tries to pitch me, and again, anybody tries to pitch me on an AML or a KYC platform that's kick-ass, I'm not interested because I've got the Canadian securities industry, which is a really kick-ass KYC AML platform. And so by putting the trading facilities for uh, tokenized securities, in effect, behind the securities industry firewall, we can take care of all of the security and access and compliance issues that you know are, have supposedly been bedeviling people uh, all along in the marketplace. I have real faith that this is an important new a important new asset classes in the security space will create it by blockchain technologies and the and the path that's been blazed uh, by the uh, folks that have uh, designed and launched cryptocurrencies using that technology. But as I say, from a regulatory perspective, I don't see that there are that many hard questions out there anymore. So Dan, you're a happy customer. Yeah, so I, I myself am I'm very skeptical of the whole uh, securities token space. I, it, it, 
it doesn't make sense to me in, in, in many of the ways that, that, that people are describing it and, and the properties they espouse to it. Because one thing that, that makes tokens so good and so efficient is their nature as a bearer instrument. You can't have that with a, with a security token. And unless you have a really deep um, identity layer that's, that's, that's really uh, global and as easy to use to, to, to bring those efficiencies to it, you're really talking about what you've always had, in my opinion. And you're not bringing anything uh, as, as far as these tokens go, as, as, as far as the technology to get rid of certain middlemen, like you know, uh, clearing houses, transfer agents, and all of those, I can see some efficiencies there. But as far as what people talk about security tokens, I really don't see any efficiencies there at all. John, you've just low trotted to Bermuda. What has your experience been there compared to Canada and elsewhere? So it's, a, it's an interesting jurisdiction because they, they do have the independence um, and, and they've, they've seen uh, a lot of opportunity in the insurance space. As I'm sure people are aware, it's uh, the Global Center for Reinsurance and they saw the opportunity to create uh, a regulatory regime around giving um, you know, status and legitimacy to any kind of business that's in this space, uh, managing or touching at some point. Uh, assets, whatever they may be, they're represented on a blockchain, be they, you know, cryptocurrencies or things that are actually securities, and specifically managing the, you know, the technology and the tools around that. Um, a, you know, a, a fantastic set of regulations for a small country to come out with and, uh, and work towards, you know, uh, looking at how other global regimes can adopt that. Uh, certainly, a, you know, a, a major uphill battle there in terms of just getting uh, that kind of recognition in international jurisdictions. But um, I think what's important to point out that they've certainly taken note of and, and I think is not really present in kind of the existing non-security cryptocurrency space, if you want to call it from a, a technology standpoint, is just the retail grade nature, if, if I can call it that at best, of you know a deposit taking institution, which is also a fiduciary uh, duty that it holds to its clients, which also may be counterparty to your trades in a non-transparent fashion. And this sort of so-called exchange is somehow you know the standard that everybody has and, and seems comfortable with with really only AML regulation at best around how they operate uh, for trading of any cryptocurrency to fiat. I mean, that to me is, is something that's kind of terrifying. And you see this so-called fake news a couple of weeks ago of Goldman Sachs not having a crypto trading desk. Well, I think that's more to do with the fact that none of these platforms that are out there today are, are even approachable in the slightest, right? It's not with a 20-foot pole kind of an arrangement. And that, which is something certainly I'm working on, is, uh, is, is key to solving this and really bring a lot of the, the sort of the business processes of the, the traditional securities exchange kind of model from an electronic trading infrastructure and, and regulatory perspective to this space to make it work. Now, on, with, with Marcus, I've, I've got a little backstory quickly there. When I first engaged Galing, specifically Usman Sheikh, 18 months ago, uh, he had to convince the partners that blockchain and ICO, ICOs is a thing. Uh, he tells me now that practice is now, uh, what, 80 staff? Uh, close to 60, I think, across well, Canada. There we go. So at least on the legal and the regulatory side, the guys are doing great from the business. But please give us an update of what's happening. Um, yeah, this is a, a tricky topic, and everybody loves lawyers, I'm sure. Um, and three or four of my clients are here in the room today. Um, it's square peg, round hole, really, we're seeing. I mean, you've got in, people like yourselves coming to the table with innovative new products, but um, the thing the regulators are struggling with is they're stuck with the laws that are in place today. And so while you have things like the OSC Launchpad, you can go and speak to them and, and, and try and find ways to comply with the um, Ontario laws. Uh, it, they're struggling to get to grips with the technology and how it works. Um, other jurisdictions around the world, such as the Financial Conduct Authority in uh, the UK, um, they have re in February they re they suggested forming a global uh, a network of regulators to try and pool best practices and regulation. And I don't know whether any of you have seen this, but in September um, the global um, the global financial innovation network formed and. They released a consultation paper that uh, we're actually speaking to them about in a number of our offices. And it's a collaboration between the OSC, AMF, Financial Conduct Authority in the UK, the Singapore, Hong Kong, and a few of the Middle Eastern regulators. And the idea there is all of the regulators recognize that they're struggling to deal with the, the tidal wave of blockchain and innovation. And so they've set up this network to try and uh, work together on best practices and I think you touched on one of the big issues is that in certain jurisdictions 
um, if, if you're doing an ICO, it's perfectly acceptable, maybe in Ontario or BC, um, less so. And so the regulators have realized that there's not um, a common playing field. They've realized that it's costing people a lot of money um, and people like yourselves are having to go to people like me across the world and pay lots and lots of money to get legal opinions um, on what you're doing. And so we're seeing that regulators are starting to work together now, trying to find common ground and um, offering companies the opportunity to come to them and try and find ways forward together. So. Great. In, in, in the few years that I've been involved, uh, my claim to fame is I helped put the first Bitcoin ATM uh, established it in Vancouver, BC, in the world. So we uh, a world first there, apart from Ethereum, which is another story. Um, but a lot of Canadians have left, including Ethereum, Canada, and set up shop elsewhere because of better tax treatment, uh, better regulatory clarity and governance and so forth. Uh, where does that leave Canada? Is it just we double down on the rules that we have? Or do we look at Bermuda, Malta, and other jurisdictions, Singapore, who declared, interestingly enough, two weeks ago, they don't see any of these token issues being securities. They, in fact, think they're all utilities in terms of the, the way and, and the purpose for which they've been designed. So not everybody is on the same page. Is, is there a, a, a time somewhere in the near future where there is greater regulatory alignment? And where does that, that leave Canada and entrepreneurs who want to either come here, set up shop, or leave, for that matter? Well, there's always going to be jurisdictional arbitrage, and you're never going to see a state where, in fact, the, uh, uh, the regulations are common across the world. We certainly in Canada have to get our act together in terms of the infrastructure to actually bring these products to market in a credible, well-regulated uh, uh, way. And I will disagree with uh, what Shadan said about uh, the, you know, the lack of, uh, of you know, that, that, that we're missing something with the approach that we're taking, because we're actually going to cut billions of dollars of cost out of the existing system, which has got to be worth something. And yes, we are going to disintermediate some folks. But the other thing is that the products, you know, we are going to use the power of the token to deliver new investment products to people that currently are either stuck in the private equity world or don't exist at all. And the basic reason for that is getting rid of the friction on entitlements management, uh, which basically the, you know, the blockchain and the smart contract is designed to do so that payments can flow more easily from the issuer to the end holder uh, and bring together some very conventional type products from the private equity world like uh, mining royalties, oil and gas royalties, or start to get really creative with things like back office of, uh, or sorry, back catalog of uh, musicians and photographers and other people with uh, portfolios of intellectual property. We can do these things as a system, but as I say, we have to actually get off our butts and, and sure. uh, get it into production. So Dan, you've placed a few bits in this space. Where do you see yeah. it all going? Well, I, I don't think there's a disagreement there because I'm, I'm, I'm completely aligned on that vision. But what I, what I, what I think there is, your, you know, what blockchains bring is their, their solution is a payment solution for any industry, right? So if, if, if you can give out dividends really cheaply, if you can give out a few cents dividends, let's say, on, on a unit, you can sell that unit very cheaply. If, if, if you disintermediate this intermediate, a uh, you know clearinghouse or a transfer agent, that's that's a a big deal. But uh, you know, as far as making the world a smaller place and making these tokens very tradable, like a utility token, and you know having that amount of liquidity and ease of trade, so some engineer in Shenzhen can buy equity in, in North America very easily and bring that kind of efficiency to the table, which is what most people who are talking about security tokens are talking about. That's not realistic and that's not going to happen unless, unless you have a global identity layer that's very easy to use where I can say, yeah, this is who I am and these other people can attest things about me in a very easy way. So um, a lot of the security token projects out there, and the CSC is one of the very few that's not like that, I think, actually, are, are, are talking things that absolutely make no sense to me. Because they're, they're talking about efficiencies that only come from cryptocurrencies being bearer instruments, which securities can't be, obviously. John, you, you've been building the digital asset exchange to rule them all. Uh, where, 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 is, where is it heading? Maybe Rich has something to say counter to that point. Um, I, I, look, I think I, I think I agree with with Shadan's points as much as I do with Rich's point as well. That um, as far as 
the liquidity enablement factor that security tokens can offer, you know, it is a cost reduction uh, within the collapsing of maybe middle and back office type processes. Some of those points of friction uh, that, that have been, you know, either reasons for it to be slow or expensive or cumbersome in other ways to issue some sort of security issuance into, uh, you know, the investor's hands. I think in that respect, the blockchain aspect has been very interesting and that's why some of these security tokens might be more attractive to deploy but also to acquire so that you, you, you can manage it more cleanly for those who are able to participate in them, maybe in a localized market or something like that, more so than necessarily you know, uh, across the planet. Um, having said that, uh, I, I do think that we'll, we'll probably find some sort of way to address that in maybe certain larger markets where you know you can group maybe in North America, Europe together into some sort of um, some sort of unit where there is some cohesion versus maybe the whole planet in itself. Um, but I think this is going to be a very interesting space going forward because of the nature of um, you know this technology becoming now very pervasive in in not only just the issuance of these non-security products but also the security ones where hopefully banks brokers and others start to pick up that ability to manipulate and, and handle and, and um, distribute these assets and, and maybe we'll see something like crypto ADRs which I know has already been discussed where existing securities can be tokenized where it, you know a, a token which is recognized in one jurisdiction but not transferable out of there can be then replicated onto some other sub-representation for appropriate jurisdiction where it would like to be deployed. The list goes on and on and I think uh, a lot of that comes down to the plumbing quite frankly as to who, how and where um, all of this is, is going to be able to manage. But again, more than anything else, and again, I'm slightly biased in saying this, but the ability to actually create that liquidity, which really comes down to these exchange-like platforms of one kind or another, decentralized or centralized, is probably the single biggest piece of high-performance infrastructure with uh, you know, regulatory status and sort of that, that level of trust uh, involved that needs to happen right away. If we can get some free legal advice. <laughs> <laughs> Is our regulation ready for this play? Security tokens, tokenized assets, is it good to go? Well, first off, uh, nothing I say is legal advice today, so I just want to add that caveat in there before everybody starts phoning the managing partner. But um, is the regulation ready? No, uh, but it's progressing. And I think um, actors like IROC, the OSC, they're taking forward steps, and they're speaking to industry players like yourselves. I know that we're in regular consultation with them. Um, and so, you know, we are taking strides forward and it's interesting that um, I often, for obvious reasons, look back to the UK and see what they're doing because the London market's pretty vibrant and um, the UK Parliament commissioned a paper and in looking into crypto assets and the regulation of them and they, they looked at that main question, what's going to be best here? Do we go for a whole, do we, do we scrap, scrap everything and build up from the ground? Or do we try and use what we have and adapt it? And the, the House of Commons committee turned around and said, actually, we should probably use what we have and adapt it because there's not enough time to build it from scratch because the industry is moving so quickly. And so, yes, it's not a perfect world right now, but I think everybody's working hard to try and get there. And the, uh, the feedback we've had from the OSC and some of the other regulators across Canada and from our colleagues in other jurisdictions too, is that the regulate the industries look into the regulators to say, hey guys, um, this is what you need to do to comply, but then the regulators are saying we don't really understand what it is that you do. Can you tell us what you think you need to do uh, to comply with the rules? And so I think moving forward, the, um, both both sides of the table need to kind of come together and work together, and uh, we're seeing a lot of that through the the launch pad here in uh, Ontario. Do you see more people entering that launch pad because there hasn't been a great uptake? Yes and no. Um, some clients take the approach, uh, we're going to go ahead and do it and ask for forgiveness. Other clients want to go to launch pad. Um, being frank, uh, the biggest inhibitor at the minute is time because, again, you're all working in an industry that's moving at light speed. and. For when for a regulator to take months to come back to you, the game's changed, the products have changed, and clients have moved on to someone else that can service their needs. So I think that's a big challenge at the minute. We are still seeing a lot of people take that route. Um, however, we are starting to see people turn around and say, we'll deal with it when they come after us. So, But on that note, we've had a lot of phone calls uh, <laughs> uh, when, uh, when the regulators come knocking. So, As we wrap up, I want to ask a question about from each panelist around in, in your space, 
where do you see the future in terms of, we, we heard this year was going to be the big year for the institutional investors to come on board and the market was going to go to the moon, as in bigger and better than in January when we, when we had, I think, 850 billion uh, market capital just on, on cryptocurrencies alone. Is that still uh, in process? Are we ready from a regulatory side, from an exchange side? from a investment side and setting up kind of next generation solutions and bridging between traditional and uh, the so-called de decentralized exchanges. In fact, I'm curious to ask, decentralized exchanges, are, are they a threat to you at all? Or no. is it an opportunity? But it's no, it's, a, it's absolutely an, a, a, an opportunity. As I say, in some respects, I'm pretty sure that the first guy who figured out the internet protocol could be used to power a private network uh, was, was, was probably beaten uh, severely by the folks that you know wanted to build a public internet. In fact, the technologies are are perfectly applicable to these private closed settings that assure provide high levels of security assurance and regulation. Um, and uh, you know, for that reason, I, I will state, and I may not get out of here alive, but I'm a, I'm, I'm deeply skeptical on, on the crypto space. Uh, I am a advocate publicly for the power of the underlying technology. I'm, I'm deeply pro the crypto space, obviously, but uh, I I think uh, decentralized exchanges are absolutely needed because right now the the biggest risk is uh, custodianship, and that's what's preventing a lot of money from coming into this place, and that solves it. And uh, it again for for a bare instrument that's absolutely critical, and every solution that that we're per personally working on involves decentralized custodianship. It has to be that way for this space to really move forward. Um, on the topic of decentralization, I think for regulators, the most important thing for them is to figure out the identity layer that I was talking about. Otherwise, what's going to happen is they're going to miss the boat. And much like how countries are formed, where they say, you know, we are an independent country and other people recognize them in a very decentralized sort of fashion, or how the cannabis industry formed, where, you know, regulators weren't really involved, people just did their own thing and laws came to be. The same thing is going to happen with the crypto space, where where you know people just assert things, and by you know other people acquiescing and, and agreements being placed, and people saying, "Yeah, what you're saying, I agree with it." Those will be the law of the land. So that's how I think it, it progresses, really. John, uh, yeah, I, apart from the custodial issue, insurance. Insurance is a massive issue in this in this space. I think um, we're we're seeing that now. Just touching on the Bermuda regulation, for example, there is a desire. There is a I should say there uh, to have your assets on behalf of your client base uh, certainly in custody but also insured and so how do you even quantify what a policy would have to look like for this because there's all kinds of very unique factors aside from the typical ones of some sort of a hack or some sort of a you know catastrophic loss because somebody destroyed a key or things of that sort um, but things like uh, just a non-zero chance of, uh, of collision events where you create a private key which happen to control some sort of asset base things like that they're wholly outside of anything any traditional clearing agent or custody agent would have ever had to consider in the past uh, and certainly not part of any checks and balances processes that they have. But I think having said that, you look at the, the amount of wealth that was created in this space last year and sort of the amount of money that suddenly uh, appeared. I think the, the brain uh, pool has come with it, right? That, that group of talent, whether they were in technology firms or they were in financial services firms or, or some sort of uh, you know, crossing point in between the two within FinTech overall, I think that talent is, has definitely invested a lot of time from what I've seen in the last several months, uh, you know, post sort of price decline because a lot of people made their decisions in February after the January peak. Of course, bonuses paid to then jump out and do whatever they're doing. And so I think we'll see a lot of that tech and that, uh, that sort of chicken and egg solution come out where some of these uh, propositions coming to market will bring with them things that help cross some of the regulatory or, you know, other, other practical concerns uh, and hopefully help sort of mutually sort this whole thing out from that perspective. Marcus? Uh, finally, uh, I, I think there's going to be a lot of global, uh, a, gl a lot of global collaboration in uh, steps forward, because I think around the world people are struggling to deal with this, and everybody's coming to the table with a different solution. Some are working better than others for different reasons, and I think uh, you're going to see the regulators start to work together on a on a more regular basis. I heard somebody ask you outside if you offer escrow services, for instance. Is that where legal firms go. Thanks for that one. Um, 
we don't offer escrow services. Uh, whether it's something that will be in the legal sphere in the future, I don't know. Um, but the law firms, I know our law firm is trying to adapt to the, uh, to the technological change for sure. Thank you very much. It was a great panel. Thank you all for your time. All right. Thank you so much.